Hi there, I'm Kathleen Jasper, and today I'm talking about the elementary math exam, specifically the 5008 and the 7813. I get a lot of requests for this particular test. Let's get started. All right, so today I'm working through the math portion of the 5008 and the 7813. I wanna go through some of these more complicated math questions that people are having a hard time with. I get a lot of messages regarding these two particular exams, so I wanna do a YouTube video so you guys can work through these. Now, I've already done one YouTube video on both of these exams for the math, and I'll link that up here. Today, I am focusing mainly on the 5008. However, the 5008 and the 7813 three are both very similar math exams, so this will work for both. Then at the end of this video, I'm going to show you some opportunities that we are having coming up for some courses regarding this math specifically. All right, so stay tuned to the end. Now let's go ahead and look at my presentation here. Um, when you work through the math in this elementary education exam, both the 5008 and the 7813, you have to understand students' processes for learning math. You have to understand how to teach math. You have to understand how to identify errors and correct them and help students with fix-up strategies and things like that. And you have to know how to do the math. So this particular exam is very complicated and I understand why so many people are having a difficult time with it. So let's take a look at this question here. Of course, I'm always going to start backwards. And on a math exam, you may not be able to find the correct answer right away by working backwards. But by reading the answer choices first, you can understand what you're being asked to do. So in this situation, the first answer choice here is have students use base 10 blocks to represent the number 21 and 12 separately. All right. The second one is have students use tiles to represent an array of two times six is 12. Okay. Second is have students count from 12 to 21. The next is have students determine which number is greater between 12 and 21. And the last one is have students determine how many tens and ones are in the numbers 12 and 21. Okay, so I can see from the answer choices that I'm looking for different skills that students might be using and also different manipulatives. We have base 10 blocks here, tiles, maybe some counters, um, those types of things. So we do have a couple with manipulatives and then we have some that are just skills. Let's go ahead and read the question so I understand exactly what's going on here. All right, so let's start up here now. Ms. Jones is working with her students on two digit numbers. Okay, that's important information there. She wants to be sure her students understand directionality, another important word, in reading numbers. Which of the following activity will reinforce that skill? So it looks like I'm only having to choose one correct answer here, which is a blessing. Normally you have to choose two or three, so it's much easier when you just have one to choose. So let's take a look at A. Have students use base 10 blocks to represent the number 21 and 12 separately. Now I like A because notice the difference in directionality in both of these numbers, right? 21 and 12. They both have the same numbers in them, but when you read from left to right, like we do with numbers left to right, they are different numbers. So A looks good and the base 10 blocks is important because that helps with two digit numbers. So let's say we have the long strip. This is our 10. So I'm going to attempt to draw this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then you would probably have one, two. That would be for 12, right? And then if I wanted to do, so this equals 12, and let's do for 21. So I would have two tens sticks here. And we'd have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right. And then we would have a one here, that would equal 21. So those are what base 10 blocks look like. My drawing is very poor here, and I think I might even have 11 in this stick here, but just, you know what I'm trying to do here. There are those snap cubes or base 10 blocks. You can use, the snap cubes are a little bit different, but you can make it, um, a uh, cube of 10, um, or they have those long sticks that represent 10, and then we have the, the um, 
the separate ones that represent ones, and these are good for directionality in this case, but also for place value. And this is working both of those, place value and directionality, okay? So I like A, and especially, even if I didn't know what base 10 blocks were, I can see that the direction of these two numbers is kind of switched around and students would need to know that. So I like the first one. Let's go to the second one. Have students represent an array of two times six is 12. Now let me show you what an array is. An array is um, multiplication. Sometimes it is used for the beginning of geometry. But if we have two times six is 12 in, a, in an array, we have one, two, three, four, five, six. These are terrible tiles, I apologize. One two, three, four, five, six. These are supposed to be squares. They are not, I apologize, but let's just pretend they're squares. And you can see that I have two times six equals 12. This is the start of multiplication and geometry. And in this case, that's not what's happening here. So I'm gonna cross off that second answer choice. Um, the third one, have students count from 12 to 21 consecutively. That's just counting. That has nothing to do with the directionality we're looking for here. So I'm gonna cross that off. The, the next one, have students determine which number is greater. 12 is less than 21, 21 is greater than 12. That's just about bigger and smaller numbers, not necessarily directionality, gonna cross that off. And the last one, have students determine how many tens and ones are in the number 12 and 21. Okay. Um, you might you might be tempted to choose the last one, but really that's assessing place value and not necessarily directionality. This first one here assesses um, place value with the base 10 blocks, but also directionality, which is really important. So I'm gonna cross off this last one and go with the first answer choice there. So that's how you can kind of figure that out. Again, not an easy question. And if you haven't taught math before, it would be kind of um, difficult. But now that you know what those types of manipulatives are, the base 10 blocks and the tiles, and you kind of know what those skills are that will help you with those types of answers. So this is a foundational skill. This is for your early grades. Directionality is for kindergarten, first grade. As they move through the higher grades, they're gonna be working on more complex math. All right, so let's take a look at the second question I have for you guys today. This one's a little bit more difficult. And I'm gonna just jump down here really quickly, take a look. I have a lot going on in this question. So it says, which four of the following skills were used in solving this problem? Okay, and so I have finding equivalent fractions, finding the greatest common factor, simplifying fractions, finding the least common multiple, multiplication, and then division. Okay, that's a lot, and I am being asked about, I can see there's a lot going on with fractions. I can see there are fractions here, getting my brain ready to kind of work through this. Let's take a look at what's going on here. Also, I have to choose more than one. I have to choose four, all right? So that's like a little bit harder than normal. So we have Mr. Rodriguez is helping students add fractions. So we've added, we're adding our fractions here, one-third plus three-fourths plus five-ninths, okay? One of the students uses the following strategy to complete the problem. All right, so you can see the student took this here and turned it into this here. We have 36, which is a common denominator of three, four, and nine, right? And the student also correctly uh, change the numerators, right? Because if you change the denominator, you have to change the numerator. So what did we do? We multiplied three by 12 to get to 36, and we have that 12 there. We multiplied four times nine to get to 36, so we had to do the same with this three here, times nine times 12. And we did that there with the 27. And then this nine times four equals 36. So we have to do the same with the five here and we get 20. So it looks like everything is working out well here. The student is doing it correctly. And we have, we come, uh, we get to 59 over 36. Let me just make sure that is correct. 12 plus 27 plus 20 equals, yes, that is 59. And then the denominator is 36. So it looks like we've got the correct answers here. Now let's take a look at what we did here to solve this problem. Now, did we use equivalent fractions? Yes, we did, because guess what? 
1 third equals 12 over 36. That's an equivalent fraction. 3 fourths equals 27 over 36, equivalent fraction. 5 ninths equals, what did we say, 20 over 36. All of those are equivalent fractions. If we were to reduce 12 over 36, we would get 1 third. If we reduce 27 over 36, we would get 3 fourths. And if we were to reduce 20 over 36, we would get 5 ninths. So equivalent fractions, check. I'm gonna go with the first box. Finding the greatest common factor, no. You don't find the greatest common factor when you're working with fractions. You're finding the least common multiple. Well, what's the difference? A lot of people have a hard time with that. The greatest common factor are, I always say, they are inside the number. So let's say you have the numbers, uh, you have the number 36 and you have the, um, the number 45 and you want to figure out what is the greatest common factor here well 36 is 9 and 4 it could also be um 12 and 2 or i'm sorry 12 and 3 uh 45 there's some factors here of 9 and 5 um i believe let me just Sorry, I gotta do a little math here. We'll go with nine and five here. I believe nine is the greatest common factor of 36 and 45. I don't think there's anything higher there. So nine would be the greatest common factor. Notice that the factors are inside the numbers. That's not what we're doing here. We actually go outside of the numbers for the least common multiple, which is yes, right here check so we're not using the greatest common factor so we can cross that off we are finding the least common multiple though let's go ahead and grab that one why because 36 is the least common multiple of three four and nine it is the smallest number we can find the least common number that we can find that three four and nine all go into so that is working there i'm going to come back to simplifying fractions let's take a look at multiplication and division. Did we use that skill? Yes, we did. How did we use multiplication? Well, I showed you before. We multiplied 3 to get to 36, or if we divide 3 into 36, we get 12. So we have to multiply the top by 12, right? If we divide 4 into 36, we get 9. So we have to multiply 3 times 9. And if we divide 9 into 36, we get four and we have to multiply five times four in order to change the numerators here so we use both multiplication and division so i have my four it's asking me for four let's talk about simplifying fractions here did we simplify fractions no we did not because 59 over 36 is already simplified and we didn't need to simplify any fractions so um that is not one of the things we're using there. And it's asking for four, and we know we definitely found equivalent fractions. We definitely used the least common multiple, which was 36. We used multiplication, which you can see here, and we used division because we had to figure out how many times three went in 20, 36, how many times four went in, how many times nine went in. So those are the four skills we're using here. Now, let me show you a different way this could be asked on the exam, all right? Same exact thing is going on here. Let's take a look at the question. Which two skills is the student lacking as she is solving the problem? So now I'm working backwards and instead of it being which skills did the student use to solve the problem, right now I'm trying to figure out what skill is the student lacking. So we've got finding greatest common factor, simplifying fractions, finding the least common multiple, multiplication, or division. All right, let's take a look. Mr. Rodriguez is helping students add fractions. We have the same thing going on here. One of his students uses the following strategy to complete the problem. So we have three, four, nine as our denominator, and then we have 108. Now, do three, four, and nine all go into 108? Yes, they do. If I multiply three times four times nine, I get 108, which means 108 divided by three goes in 36 times. 4 goes into 108 tw 4 goes into 108 27 times which we multiplied by that 3 which we got 81 and 9 goes into 108 12 times 
So notice what the student did here. The student found a common denominator, but not the least common multiple. So while the student did find the common denominator, we want the least common denominator or the least common multi multiple because then you get this crazy big number here and it becomes, you know, weird. So what we want to do is that's one of the skills a student is lacking, finding the least common multiple. So I'm going to circle C as one of my skills that the student is lacking. Now, another thing we need to figure out here is uh, what the other skill is. Now, did the student use multiplication and division properly? Yes, the student did. So I'm going to cross those off. Notice that the student divided by three properly to get 36, then multiplied the 36 times one to get this numerator. Same with the three fourths. The, uh, the student divided four into 108, got 27, then multiplied three times 27 in order to get this 81 here. And the same for five ninths. So the student did use multiplication and division properly. All right. Now we didn't, um, we didn't, uh, use the greatest common factor again. You can cross that off. If you see greatest common factor with fractions, you can probably cross it off. It's probably a skill that you're not going to use. It's the wrong skill with this particular thing. And that leaves us with B, simplifying fractions. And why? Because 177 over 108 is actually not uh, simplified. It can be taken down more. Look, let's just take a look. 177 divided by three is 59. And 108 divided by three is 36. That brings us down to our simplif simplified fraction there. So the student failed to simplify this and failed to find the least common denominator or the least common multiple. So that's going to be B and C. So I did those two problems two different ways so you could see how you might see them on the test. One, the student did it correctly. And two, the student did not do it correctly and you had to find the error. All right, and then you might get something simple like this. A chef is using one fourth of a cup of crab for one serving of crab cakes. How many cups of crab will the chef need for 24 servings? All right, so whenever I see a um, problem like this, I always like to use my matchy matchy. I like to use proportions in these problems. It's just my go-to. I, it helps me keep things straight. You may have another way of doing it, but I like to use matchy matchy. So we have, um, the chef is using one cup of crab for one serving. So I have crab over servings equals crab over servings, servings. All right, so in this case, I have one fourth over one serving equals, I'm not sure how much crab is needed for 24 servings. Again, there are lots of ways you could do this problem, but if I were gonna multiply 24 times one fourth or 24 times 0.25, I'm gonna get six, and one times X is X, six equals X, X equals six. The answer is six. Now, of course, you can see here, we have um, one fourth and 24. And if we were to divide uh, 24 by four, we would get six. There are a lot of different ways in which you could do this, but I like to do matchy matchy proportions because it always comes out properly for me. I use proportions for everything. So that is one way you might see this problem you are going to have just straight up math problems that you're going to have to do conversions and things like that. You may see this problem, which strategy could the student use to figure out this problem? Well, the student could use proportion, the student could use division, the student's using multiplication here. So there's all different ways in which this question could be asked. In this case, it's just a straight up math problem. But again, you're going to have to do math and you're gonna to have to know how to teach math. So it becomes pretty complicated, but hopefully this video helped you today. Now, one thing I wanna to bring to your attention is that I will be having a session, a math session for the 5008 and the 7813 on December 11th. Obviously, if you are watching this in the future, it's already happened and you can go ahead and just sign up for it on my website. But if you go to the link below, you can register for the December 11th math session for the 5008 and the 7813. It comes with a study 
Friday guide that is not finished yet. I am recording this video the day before Thanksgiving in 2021. So it is November 24th, 2021 today, right now. Um, but it will be available before the live session on December 11th, 2021. Now, if you're watching this in the future, hello, future people, it's already done. You can click the link, download the study guide, and it's already ready for you. But if you are watching this before December 11th, 2021, it's going to be a live course. It will be recorded so that you can access it later. So no problem if you can't attend live. And if you're watching in the future, it's already a recorded course with a downloadable study guide. So. Just go ahead and use the link in the description below and you can sign up for the webinar or access the recording in the future. Remember, you can always go to KathleenJasper.com for online courses, books, and our Amazon Prime page here has all of our physical study guides. So definitely check that out. Thank you so much for watching. Consider giving this video a thumbs up and subscribing to our YouTube channel. Have an awesome day. Thank you so much for watching. We have a ton of videos on my YouTube channel please consider subscribing and following me on my social media networks at Kathleen Jasper. Have a great day.